Okay, so, got that going on. Uh, don't worry, we'll see that too. Hang on a second. So tests will be, uh, I always said everyone wants to talk about tests. Uh, tests aren't created yet, there's a lot of essay to go. Scantron sort of got ran, and so I'll, I'll start to figure that out. So sometime by the weekend, you'll, you'll have your grades up. Oh, you know, probably by Saturday for sure. So, uh, we'll see. I have no idea how, how people did it. Overall, Scantrons, you know, have a have a range kind of like they did last time, from from uh, from good to bad to ugly. You know, I mean, so the whole so the whole spectrum. So we'll kind of see where you are. Uh, one thing I want to tell you is like for people that are real serious about how to bribe teachers and get extra credit, I have an autograph from Jesse from Aaron Paul. So one of my students actually came from Palomar, actually went to the, the, the season finale. I'm talking Breaking Bad, baby. And uh, she got tickets up there. And so somehow she got in the crowd and like handed this out. And, and basically, so anybody that knows Breaking Bad and Jesse, okay, Aaron Paul, I, I have it. And, and of course, I have some, some blue crystal for her. <laughs> so that's taking extra credit seriously. Okay. All right. So that, that was pretty cool. Uh, <coughs> Okay, so we begin the next section. Now, this section is is a hard section. Some people think the cardio test is the hardest test of all five. Uh, you can decide on that. Uh, the uh, but I know, a lot of people think that. A decent amount of people that have gone through it. You could. Some people, you know, I mean, the next two tests are the hardest. There's no doubt about it. Okay, they're, they're going to cover the most material. And, uh, and, and add sort of a lot of critical thinking involved, and it's this and then the kidney. Now, the, the idea is, I, th I think that the subject matter of the kidney, because we sort of integrate four systems together at that point, I think that's harder, but you just don't realize how much smarter you're getting. And so by the time you actually get there, it sort of clicks, and, 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 the, and basically I think people, I, some people think the, card, the, the uh, kidney one's harder, but a lot of people think this is hard. So, so be ready for this. Uh, well, we're going to stay on it. It's, it's usually the, the student's favorite section, though, because cardiovascular is really important, and we have a lot of, you know, a lot of us know a lot about it already uh, from, you know, family experience, et cetera. So it's, it's a really good section. You're going to see what we've just learned, active potentials, et cetera, are going to help us for this section, because when we see active potentials of the heart, we're like, I get it, okay? You might some of the details might be slightly different, but you basically will get it. So it's a really, really good section. I, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy it. So that's where we're going to begin now. The uh, other thing to mention, then I'll actually start talking, is in lab, we do have lab. So, so we're back to lab. We have a, it's a blood lab in which you get to do blood typing of yourself. Basically, we're only going to do two of the lab things, which is going to be doing your blood typing and then doing your hematic credit. So there's other things in the lab protocol that we're going to skip. I'm going to give a, a lecture on how to do, how to know blood typing. If you're a given blood type, what you can receive, who can receive your blood. I'll do that first, uh, which will be kind of on this next test too. So, but I'll do that in lab, and then we'll, we'll do that lab. So that's, that's tonight and then on Monday. But your, your lab test is coming right up the following lab period. So that means tonight or Monday, depending on which lab you're in, what you want to have done or want to do is to bring in, or have studied some, which is hard to know, but at least have bringing in those six lab sheets that, uh, that we've done. Because the lab, the lab test is going to be very, very literal based upon those handouts that I, that I put out as far as uh, uh, you know, mold conversion, that chart with tonicity, all that stuff is going to be the lab test. So, so this, besides, this next lab period, besides doing the blood lab, 
It's also going to be review for the lab test, but I need you to, I'm not going to just go through every one, and here's number one, here's number two. You know, you have to have, uh, you know, your material there, and we'll start to see what questions we have. Of course, you don't have to stay for lab review. You know, that's up to you. But is that on Monday? That's today and Monday because the oh, tests are, yeah, yeah. if you're a Wednesday lab, you have a test a week from today. Mm -hmm. If you're a Monday lab, you have a test a week from Monday. Okay. So this next lab is when you do the review. So for people tonight, we're doing uh, that in review. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, next Monday, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll start office hours again. You can come to office hours uh, as for, for, for next Monday as well. So if, it, so if you need more help, I'm talking Wednesday, people. If you need more help on Monday, then try to use that for me as well. Uh, but you're going to see it's very, very literal, okay? It's going to be like almost cutting and pasting those sheets, just changing the numbers. I mean, there's no critical thinking, no strange questions. It's simply, you know, you have a strong, you have HCl, one molar HCl, what's the pH? You have 0.1 molar uh, Acetic acid, what's the pH? Just like it was on there. So it's going to be exactly. So you just want to make sure you know how to do those problems. It's a really good opportunity for a lot of people to get like, you know, 59 out of 60 because if you have trouble on this, on the material in my test, which a lot of people do, they're hard, uh, it's a way to, to sort of boost your grade up as long as you can do, you know, math. Okay, there is math on that test. Okay. So yeah, I'm just full of good news today. But we're going to begin the heart. And the other thing in lab too, there's a couple of video clips on, we're going to look at heart valves and a few heart valve uh, disorders and hear how, how you can actually hear murmurs. And it's so hard to, see, you know, we don't have, it's just hard to set it up to actually show it right now in here. So probably in lab, I'll probably set that up so what we're talking about today and you can actually, and you'll have the site, you have it on your PowerPoint, but you'll actually hear some heart sounds today, but I can't, I just can't do it in this class. I don't have a long enough cord and anyway. Can Enough you of my problems. Like the, uh, I don't, I'm not sure about that. I mean, you definitely, you definitely hear it with a with the stethoscope. I don't know, I don't know if you if you feel it or not from the pulse. It's a good question. So let's start talking. And again, kind of, we'll, we'll do the light here. So there's my heart. Oh, it's pretty. Yeah, what, what what this is, and what in the, the in lab we're going to see a color version of this. This, you know, it's basically an echocardiogram, like you know, like you would a uh, you know, basic sonogram. But the idea of this is we can see a couple things going on here. We can see there's four chambers of the heart. Okay, what chamber would that be? Is that is that a ventricle or an atrium? Ventricle. And as, as someone already pointed out, it's going to be the left ventricle for sure because. The left ventricle is going to be responsible for pumping blood throughout the body, versus the right is just pumping it to the lungs and back, and we'll look at it. But the real thing we're going to notice, because we're going to spend a lot of time overall on our heart valve, we're looking at the two AV valves between the atrium and ventricles, and so you can see them opening and closing. And the whole idea of these valves, which we're going to talk about, the main purpose of the valves are to make sure blood is going to flow in the correct direction and it's not going to backflow. So, you know, when you had the atrium contract and emptying the ventricles, the ventricle contract is supposed to be pushing the blood into the arteries. We don't want the blood to flow back, you know, into where it came from. And that's when, in these cases, the AV valve shut. And you can see these shutting, you know, sort of really well here. Now, in lab, because I can't show it in here, we're going to talk about some problems in which you have, uh, we'll talk about two types of problems that, that, uh, that you have with the valves. But when you have a leaky valve and this doesn't shut properly, you're going to have a backflow of the blood. When the ventricle contracts, some of the blood's going to go back into the atrium. And what's cool about the Doppler ones are that, you know, they're in color and, you know, Doppler effect of what's coming, you know, uh, toward you or away from you, blue and, and red. So you actually, they actually do that. And so, and they do that for, for just not normal ones too, to look at blood flow. But in this case, because blood is basically going to be squeezed back through whatever valve doesn't shut, the part of it, you can actually see this stream of color. And so it contracts and stream of color goes in. Contract and stream of color. So you can really see sort of this problem of the blood back flowing through the valve. And that's, you know, not only does that will show that you actually have, you know, a, besides listening, it will show you, you know, the extent of, of uh, your valve leakage. But it also actually shows the velocity, too, by the, by the intensity of the color. So they can get a lot of information from this. Again, I'm not nowhere near an expert or not even close to, to being able to interpret all these. But I looked around for a couple cool ones that we can at least get some visual out of it. 
So, pretty cool. I'm not going to put like this, I like it, you know, on the test, you know, like, what is that? But, okay, here's another thing. We're just getting introduced to the heart a bit. Uh, I can update this uh, at will. But the reason I put this slide up is why we care, especially a lot of people going into healthcare, but all of us care about sort of the heart and how it works and what goes wrong. Number one killer, uh, that doesn't change even in this year. So it's number one killer in the United States. Who's number two? Cancer. cancer. Unfortunately, I can't talk much about it in this class, but again, it bothers me that, that especially a lot of you are going into healthcare or nursing. Number two killer, you should have a lot more exposure to understanding cancer. Uh, but I can't. I don't have time, and they won't let me, so that's good. Uh, but we will do heart disease. It's interesting to note uh, that in, and I might have mentioned this before, San Diego County, this is reversed. More people die of cancer than they do heart disease in San Diego, so this is more of a national thing. Why is that? Because we're health better. Yes. Yes and yes. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, all both of these, by the way, if you look at these just for a second, a lot of the, the, the risk factors that cause the, you know, mortality of these diseases are preventable, and it is the fact of, of proper diet, proper exercise, and not smoking tobacco. Okay? And so we're actually pretty good compared to other parts of the country. I think I might have mentioned I'm from St. Louis, and when I go back there, fat smoking people with RVs in their hands. Okay, that's what it is. So the, Midwest, the South especially, but really, the whole middle of the country is, I'm not laughing at them, okay? I'm, I'm one of them, okay, I'm one of them. But, uh, you know, we, we're pretty lucky on the coast in California, we are healthy, and so, you know, we still got to deal with cancer more, but we have uh, sort of helped us with heart disease. One more, just overview slide that we don't memorize, uh, of Cable 14.1, to sort of realize, or begin to, to further realize, you know, how important the cardiovascular system is. Why, when it's not functioning properly, it is so detrimental to your health. Because what it's moving throughout your body is not just the gases that we'll talk about in the next section, but all the nutrients and water that have to be distributed to all of your cells. We've got to get rid of all the waste products. But also, we're going to be dealing in Chapter 24 about the immune system, okay? We're going to be dealing in 16 about how to have, you know, uh, the clotting protein, the formation of clots, uh, Hormones, the endocrine system is dependent upon it, so it really is central to, uh, to a lot of the other systems. And what's really, really beautiful is, you know what system works hand in hand? The kidney. <laughs> the kidney, the renal system. You'll see there, that's why, when, that section is the best section of the world, and we're going to see these, these, basically, these two systems work hand in hand. You know, one a little more rapidly, one a little bit slower, but they're going to basically check each other out and sort of compensate for one another depending on, on what's going on with these systems. So that really is the culmination of, uh, of a lot of this course. So, again, very basic so far. What is the circulatory system made of, Mike? These five components. So blood, and we're going to, in chapter 16, we'll talk a little about the different, you know, some properties of blood that we want to know. But here's sort of what we're dealing with in the next two chapters. So we need a pump, which is the heart, uh, obviously very important. And then we need sort of the, uh, you know, the pipes of the system. Now it's really important to realize as we start sort of, you know, doing a little anatomy, not much, that arteries basically are uh, vessels which carry the blood away from the heart. Okay, that's really what we're going to see. Anytime you're going away from the heart, you're going to use arteries. When you're returning, you're using veins. In between, of course, will be the capillaries. And we'll talk a lot about capillaries. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a lot about how all three of these have different properties which will match their function. Arteries are going to you know, basically deliver, or, or, sorry, be under a lot of pressure, so there's going to be very thick elastic structures. Capillaries, you want easy exchange. So we're going to have that exchange epithelium in which we have very thin cells, and you know, sort of being able to leap between cells. So you know, we'll deal with that as far as function. But right now, it's just that's the five. So this is the next thing to do is to sort of realize our sort of pic picture. And, and YouTube will have some videos. In fact, I have one because you want to visualize this, not just me doing this. But we have basically two different circulations corresponding to the size of the heart. We have, on the right side of the heart, we have what we're going to list here as the pulmonary circulation. 
sort of delivering blood to the lungs and back to the heart to oxygenate. And then we have, in the next slide but on this, we have the systemic circulation, which is the left side of the heart, in which we've got to basically circulate oxygenated blood all the way through the body. So again, if you look at pulmonary circulation from this, you see that the following overall. You have blood, you know, which is, I mean, we, we color code this, you know, blue and red, and all of you are kind of familiar with that. So the blue represents, you know, deoxygenated blood. And there's plenty of oxygen in that blood, believe me, and we'll see. But it's, you know, relatively deoxygenated compared to this. So, you know, we've got a, it has carbon dioxide in it, which is bad. And so we're going to deliver that. So this circulation is basically the right atrium to the ventricle. We're leaving the heart, therefore uh, going to the lungs. So this is the pulmonary artery. We're going to do the gas exchange here, and then the, the uh, reoxygenated blood is going to return to the left side of the heart using pulmonary vein. Okay, that represents pulmonary circulation. The right side of the heart has to have enough pressure just to complete that circuit. That's the pressure it needs. <coughs> And it's important, obviously. We've got to oxygenate and the blood and to get rid of carbon dioxide, which is you know, very dangerous, can cause acidosis, etc. You look at the second. The systemic circulation, you can see it here. We're talking that you know, basically this oxygenated blood has to be delivered to the body. So it, it comes, uh, again, came in through these veins, so it comes with left atrium to left ventricle. It's pumped out. Arteries are, are vessels which leave the heart. The major one here is the aorta. And then, of course, we have these other ones. And again, the idea of the left side of the heart has to be strong enough, create enough pressure to drive this blood throughout the body. And that's why we even saw it's a bigger chamber, and it actually is a stronger muscle. It has to put it, uh, contract with greater force, enough to create enough pressure to deliver blood you know, to your entire body. Okay? So, so overall, again, the pulmonary and systemic circulation. There's always a test question related to besides just knowing where blood flows, which you should be able to know, that we sort of have a trend here with an exception. Okay? We have vessels which generally have, you know, again, we're sort of doing high and low oxygen, high oxygen, and then ones which have relatively deoxygenated blood. Okay? And so when it looks at this, it looks like arteries or veins, which one is usually highly oxygenated? Arteries. Arteries. Veins represent basically after, thing, after blood has gone through the capillary bed and delivered oxygen, we have relatively deoxygenated. But there is an exception to both of these, which is? Pulmonary system are completely reversed. So if you look at pulmonary arteries, okay, they are low O2. Because they are delivering, they're going away from the heart, so they're going away from the heart, delivering to the lungs. So pulmonary arteries are the exception there. And then the same thing on this. Now the veins, which veins are coming to the heart, that's why that overall definition, the pulmonary veins, of course, have just received their oxygen, and so they're highly oxygenated, and they're going to be coming here. So the pulmonary ones are reversed. Okay, and that's usually a test question, some multiple choice question. Just so you realize that the pulmonary system, that general trend is reversed, and you can kind of see it up there as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you like tables, there are tables as well. So, you know, it says the same thing. Any questions so far? Just sort of introduce us to the two sides of the heart and where they're going. Now, why does blood flow, Mike? Uh, well, you can already see part of the answer there. This is, this is sort of the emphasis that uh, I was trying to make before, that you know, physiology, which is cool, I think everyone realizes what it is, but we're based upon chemistry. You can see already everything is ions. We're going to keep seeing that. That's chemistry. We're also based on physics, and that's why if you're a physics, you know, physics geek or a physics person, you like all this stuff too, because not only we talked about you know, electricity and resistance, Pressure gradients. It's all gradients. Concentration gradients, electro gradients, pressure gradients. That's what's going to drive blood flowing through the vessel. Now it's important, and this slide shows it, when we're looking at blood flow, 
We're looking at a difference in pressure from one side to the other. Again, as it says, not an absolute. And this is the slide that sort of illustrates it. So you look at one side of the, two, of the you know, vessel or tube or pipe, whatever you want to call it, it's 100, this one's only 40, but this flow is going to be the exact same because you only have a difference of 25 in both cases. So it's not the absolute pressure, it's the difference of pressure, and that's going to be important. Uh, I wanted to show this, we're going to deal with this in chapter, in the next chapter for sure, that just to sort of get this visual and sort of think about this, that if we look at the mean arterial pressure, and we'll figure out how to calculate that later, it's obviously going to be the highest right as it comes out of the, um, the left ventricle, and so it's in the aorta, and that's the highest. As it's going through the arterial system, it is dropping. At the capillaries, where we do the exchange, you know, pressure drops a lot. And when you're well, basically to the venous system, it's dropping tremendously. Okay? And so the question becomes, okay, if you're under such low pressure, and just think of me standing here, and you know, I'm trying to return the venous blood from, from my legs, and it's, you know, gravity's pushing it down, we've got to figure out a way to basically get that blood back. How are we going to increase venous return to get that under such low pressure? Stay tuned. <laughs> but, but this is sort of, you know, just to get an idea of the, you know, how the pressure changes throughout the body. And really, it's sort of interesting. You might not think that coming in, you know, of what low pressure your blood is in the veins. But it is very low, and we've got a couple tricks to get it back to the heart. But, just like we were kind of talking in the nerves, the overall flow rate, you know, mils per minute, liters per hour, however we're going to describe it, it's not just the difference in pressure, but the resistance being offered. Right? The actual resistance of the fluid. Okay? And as it states here, we're going to talk about a couple of these. The resistance is affected by three main factors. And if we look at the middle one, because I'm not going to really say much about that, you know, the longer the tube, the longer from one end to the other, you know, the more resistance. And that's going to make slower flow. But that just exists in our body, right? We're not going to be manipulating, talking about that. Whatever your vessel length is, it is. But this one and this one is important. So fluid viscosity, and this is just general physics, right? It doesn't need to be talking about blood, but when fluid is passing through, if it's a more viscous substance that's more, that's more resistance, it's going to be slower, okay? That makes sense. That's just common sense. A lot of this is common sense. But, of course, for us, it's blood. And when we're looking at blood... We have cells, and we have plasma, the non-cellular part of blood that has all the different ions and nutrients, et cetera, dissolved. And that's what blood is. So overall, when we're talking resistance or how this might change under different conditions, we're looking at how this might change, the percentage of red blood cells to plasma. And since... This will be what we do in lab two. You know, we, we can do something called hematocrit, in which we'll take your blood, or you take blood, and you basically centrifuge it, and you end up having your red blood cells centrifuge to the bottom, and then the, sort of the, the, you know, the fluid at the top of plasma then will basically rise up here. And so what hematocrit measures, I can just say it now, it saves us for lab, is basically, you know, of your blood, what percentage is red blood cells? So that if this were five centimeters, and we measured from the bottom up to that, and the total height of, from the bottom of those cells to the top of the plasma is 10 centimeters. Your hematocrit <coughs> would be basically five centimeters over the total 10 centimeters times 100 equals 50%, saying that 50% of your blood is red blood cells. And we're, we're going to do this in lab, and again, approximately, depending if you're man or woman, we'll see, you know, 40 to 50% is about normal for that. That's what would actually be about normal. And we'll see that in lab. So I put that as a preview, but really to start looking at this. So viscosity has to do a lot with this idea of the hematocrit. So our, if our hematocrit is very high, and we have more cells, that would mean viscosity is more, there'd be more resistance. And so what would the heart have to do? Make more of the 
Well, right now, if you have, if you have a high viscosity blood and we're trying to pump blood throughout the body, our heart's going to be working really hard. So we're going to put the heart under strain. So you can think of really already two ways we might do this. Okay? Two ways to have a high hematocrit would be what in general? With red blood cells, more or less. More. So we might create more red blood cells, and maybe you'll avoid jail time. So when you talk about EPO, which we will in Chapter 16 too, uh, erythropoietin basically stimulates red blood cell production. So if you're trying to cheat and win the Tour de France seven times, you might consider taking EPO. And what that's going to do is raise the number of red blood cells so that you have a lot of oxygen carrying supply. But what it's going to also do is raise your hematocrit. And raising your hematocrit means it is already going to be putting your heart under most, more strain. And some people have almost died, or I don't know if anyone's actually died, I know of, but, but people have almost died because of trying to, to do that, to, to basically boost your red blood cells uh, for, for a sporting event, but you also then put your, your heart under such strain because of the viscosity of the blood. So you can increase the number of red blood cells, use, such as using that, uh, this, this hormone we'll talk about, or do what to the plasma? Okay, would you have more plasma or less plasma to have a problem here? Less. Because then you have a higher percentage. Okay, what could cause our plasma volume in general to decrease? Clotting. Oh, dehydration. Well, I mean, you know, if you really had a lot of clotting, I guess that would be bad. But, uh, but overall, for the general thing, would be dehydration. Thanks for reminding me. So, you know, when you're dehydrated, already we're going to get to this in the next two sections kind of just relating. If you're dehydrated, Okay, you have less plasma volume, your hematocrit is more, your resistance is more, and your heart is going to be working really hard. Part of, we're going to look at dehydration effect on the kidney and everything, but also on your heart as well. Your heart's under a lot of strain because you know, not only are the other factors of not having water, but your blood is becoming more and more viscous, and your heart has to work harder and harder to basically pump that blood through. So we do care about viscosity but even more the tube radius, okay? And, and again, common sense. If we're basically flowing any kind of fluid and we're going through a pipe of that diameter and the diameter decreases, what's that do to resistance? Is it increasing or, or is that more resistant or less resistant? More, more resistant. And that's going to be, you know, a, a slower flow rate. So this is good for us because... We're going to control our vessels, uh, you know, basically to either cause them, I mean, look at a generally vessel, we're going to cause both the veins and arteries to dilate, to increase their diameter, and also to constrict. And why this is so powerful is indicated by this slide, because small changes in diameter have drastic changes in resistance and flow rate. Excuse me, it's to the actual fourth power. Okay? That's, that's how much the, the radius or diameter of a tube actually contributes to this. So that if you double, as the example they gave here, if you double the radius, okay, if you're doubling the, the diameter of the, uh, of, the, of the tube, you're not just doubling the flow, okay, you're going to do it by two to the fourth or 16. So it has one sixteenth of the resistance. So basically, the flow flow rate is sixteen times that of that. Okay, so it's it's to the fourth power. It's extremely important because we're not going to generally just do that. We're not going to you know I'm not going to stand up here. My my I'm going to vasodilate and double. That would be very strange. But the idea that making very small changes are going to basically affect resistance, flow rate, and pressure. And so as I'm standing up there, in fact, as you're doing that, as you're breathing in and out. Your, your blood pressure is changing, and we're going to actually see that next chapter, so we call Next week, we'll even do it. We're going to show you how your blood pressure is constantly being monitored. Just breathing in and out is changing your blood pressure. You're going to react that second, and literally, your, your, your arteries and veins are literally constricting and dilating, constricting and dilating to try to maintain the right blood pressure. 
And so it doesn't need to go a lot. It just needs small, small differences. But small differences will have huge effects upon resistance and therefore blood pressure. So all three of those are important, again, to realize what's, what's affecting the resistance and therefore the, the, uh, the flow rate. But again, viscosity kind of related to this. Tube length is just sort of exists. We won't really deal with it. But vasoconstriction and vasodilation is going to be very important in the next you know, two weeks of how this is controlled. So for tube radius, when it says smaller offers more resistance, that means when it vasoconstricts? Yes. Okay. So that's right. Vasoconstriction is on, on the bottom here. It's getting smaller. Mm -hmm. you put your hand over a water hose, it goes really, really fast. Wouldn't that work the same way? The, the pressure build up? No, see, the, uh, well... I'm trying to think what the, the it offers more resistance, and so it, so it's it's interesting point too because the there is, there is a difference between flow rate and velocity, okay. And I'm not going to go crazy on it because it's but I want to I want to sort of address that. So flow rate is mils per minute. So if you're putting your hand over this, okay, and you're offering resistance, there's less flow, right? There's less mils per minute. But what's coming out is what faster. And so velocity actually increases, you know, as you're doing that. But the overall amount, which is flow rate, mils per minute, is going to decrease, right? Because, you know, if you count, you know, you're not getting that much out, right, because it's, it's narrow. So, so that's why we're not going to deal with velocity much, but that's a good point, actually, when it comes down to it. Does everyone sort of see that or just by common sense? When you do that, you are, what's coming out is going to increase the velocity, you know, how much per second, but overall for adding it up, the flow rate is still low because not that much is coming out per minute. But, you know, that's not, we're not, I just don't feel like, you could test, I could test you on that, but I sort of want to leave the, uh, that velocity alone because we have so much to fry. But this overall is basically going to be what we need to know. So it's actually, because that's what we're going to really be dealing with overall. We want to know, we're going to be talking about cardiac output, how much your heart is putting out in your body. How many mils per minute? How many uh, you know liters per hour, etc.? And so we're really looking at that and pressure. You know that's the, what we're going to be looking at in the next couple of weeks. Any other questions about this? The heart. The heart. Lots of anatomy. We don't care about too much of it. We we, have, well, we want to realize that the uh, atria. We call them collecting chambers. You know, they're going to contract, uh, but the ventricles are going to be the main pumpers here. And uh, obviously, those are two ventricles. We do have four chamber hearts, most of us. Mm -hmm. All right. The, uh, you know, unless you have like a defect here or something like that. So the next thing, and this is where we're going to spend a couple minutes on. I've only, this year, I've just added a little bit more on heart valves because I really want to talk about sort of when things are kind of going wrong because that's what I want to start incorporating more, a little more clinical significance instead of just like listing it. So there's a few slides. Again, this was, up, this was changed just a few days ago when it comes down to it. And this is where I have some audio-visual aids if, that I'll show you in lab. But overall, the idea again about for these heart valves are that to prevent backflow. We'll show a couple pictures. So we have two sets of valves. We have the AV valves, which are between the atrium and ventricles. Okay, left and right. You, uh, you, you, wa you want to know the names of these, especially because the left AV valve, which we'll, 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 see, we'll talk about a lot, is called you know, the mitral valve or micro valve, which is sort of, you know, you hear a lot about that. So you kind of want to know in this case and know the names of it. And we're going to show this, again, a few slides. But the bottom line is that the, uh, the AV valves are basically there that when the ventricles contract, we want the blood to go out the arteries. We don't want them to come back to the atria. So as soon as the ventricles start contracting, the AV valves are going to shut to prevent that flow back. And I'm going to show another picture of that. But we're just introducing them in these pictures. The semilunar valves, luckily their names make sense because they're basically between the ventricles and the arteries. Uh, their, their job is to prevent backflow into the ventricles. So the ventricles are going to contract, push the blood out to the arteries. Okay? Then the ventricle has to do what? Relax. Our one will be able to flow up again. So if you relax, do we want that blood to flow back in the ventricles? 
no. And that's when the semilunar valves will shut to keep the blood out there. And they're named basically on what artery they're dealing with. So the aorta is the aortic semilunar valve, and for the pulmonary artery, it's the pulmonary semilunar valve. Okay? Prevent backflow into the ventricle. So overall, the idea of how valves are supposed to work, sort of just shown here, it's a nice easy picture I decided to put in, you know, to prevent backflow is, you know, when, and let's say we're just talking the atrium and ventricles in this case, when the atrium contract, you want these valves to be basically completely open, and if they are, there's really no turbulence created. You, basically, the blood will flow from that chamber, and that means really no sound, we'll see, okay? Uh, now, the key is, once the ventricles start contracting, we want those valves, we want that pressure to shut the valve so that the blood will go out the arteries in this case. We don't want the blood to flow back to where it came from, you know, in the atria. And so that's sort of visual to kind of show how valves, how valves are supposed to function. Prevent backflow. So a couple more pictures of this. Just to start visualizing this, again, the, the, the YouTube stuff and, and other things online, you know, you can actually, you'll have more time to see it. But again, you can see these AV valves and sort of, you know, the overall structure where blood's going from the atrium to the ventricles and then out the arteries. Okay, on this side you can actually see the whole thing for the right side, right? Right atrium to right ventricle to pulmonary, uh, you know, pulmonary artery. And you can get the idea already from this. Now, if blood flows here, that's fine. We're going to contract. We want the AV valve to shut so that blood is forced out into the pulmonary artery. Then we want to relax. The blood will, but it could you know, potentially want to come back, but that pressure will shut the semilunar valve and the blood will go forward. Okay, that's actually an overall slide. Here's another couple pictures to see if this actually, sort of, if you can see it when we actually sort of, uh, you know, highlight it here. So, so we are looking at the left side of the heart. And the idea then, this has been trigger contraction. When the, we've already put the blood in, okay, the atrium is done, it's done right now. When the ventricle contracts, we want the AV valve to shut so blood doesn't flow back there, that blood will flow out the aorta, okay? And that's gonna be, again, it's on the same on the right side, the same idea, that the uh, AV valves will shut as soon as the ventricle contracts to prevent backflow. And when that happens, what are we going to hear with the stethoscope? Love. Okay? The first heart sound, and I have this on a slide in your handouts too, the first heart sound is the closing of the AV valves, both of them. They're basically closing at the same time. And I have that on, on the slide, but I can just tell you now. So basically, the ventricles contract, the AV valves shut, love, and blood then goes out to the arteries. Okay, now the ventricle is going to... Open. Relax. <coughs> Relax. Okay? Because we want blood to flow back into it, and it will. So as it relaxes, that blood, the, load, the pressure is decreasing here. We don't want that blood to, be, to basically flow back. And so that's when, as soon as relaxation begins, that's when these valves will shut. And when that happens, we hear dub, the second heart sound. And I, what's going to be really cool, I wish I could just set it up here, but we'll do it in lab is we're going to hear the heart sounds, and we're going to actually kind of see it, you know, basically on, from, a, from a website, which I gave, you know, I put on your, on your uh, handout, and you can actually do it yourself, too, uh, or on at least the PowerPoint. But you're going to see normal heart sounds of love dove. The AV valves closing, then we're going to relax, and then the set of the valves close, okay? And it keeps repeating, love dove, and you'll see the intensity of it. And what's nice about that site we're going to see, because I'm going to talk about problems now with the valves, murmurs, you're going to then be able to then see, actually sort of see the, the sound wave and hear the murmurs, what they sound like. That's sort of cool. And here it is. So, again, we're introducing terms which maybe you know, maybe you don't, and I'll keep sort of introducing it. The idea of contraction, okay, when the ventricles are contracting, or the atrium, when, that comes, when it comes down to it, is systole. Okay, systole is contraction. So again, as soon as the ventricles contract, as soon as they go into systole, that's going to close the AV valves to prevent backflow, and that's love, first heart sound. Okay, then the, the uh, do I have this? Yeah, when the ventricles begin to relax, 
lower pressure so that other blood can come in. That's diastole. So relaxation is diastole. And when that happens, when this relaxes and the pressure increases, the semilunar valves will shut, and that's dub. Dub dub. So, again, you know, some of this too, if you haven't had this at all, I mean, you've got to sort of look at this and study it, and really, you'll see mine and the others, having visuals, you know, will actually really help. I also want to say, if you, uh, I probably said all this, you know, I never even want to repeat myself with all these classes, but when you, uh, if you come across some good videos as you're going through the course, which you probably do on the YouTube, especially ones which don't go beyond kind of our level too much, because sometimes you get ones that, that will be like so complicated that might actually not help you uh, understand what we're doing. But if you find ones at bottom level that are really illustrated, that really help you, sort of send them to me so that I can actually look at them and maybe use them, or, or at least give the next class's resources, because uh, you, you can find more of them than I can. I just found a couple. Any questions so far, though? Everyone kind of get the idea of the AV valve, semilunar, preventing backflow. Are we ready for some murmurs? Yes. So there's, there's two types that we're going to learn. Two types of heart problems that we're going to learn, and we're going to see how it affects the, uh, the sounds when we're actually listening to it. So there's, and right now, I mean, if you do, I actually have them both on the same one, and of course I have, you know, if you have a handout, et cetera, you're going to see it. But there's stenotic valves, uh, which, and, uh, and basically sort of, uh, sorry, leaky valves, they're also called insufficient. So leaky valves and stenotic. The idea of stenotic valves are that the valves are, are stiff. They're not opening completely. So as blood's trying to flow through from one chamber to the other through an open valve, it's going to be restricted. And you're going to hear a sound when you're going to see it. Basically, it's, it's more of a high-pitched sound, and the, and the source I got this from is kind of calls it a, calling it a whistle. And you'll hear it doesn't quite sound like a whistle, but it's a different pitch than what's going to happen over here. So again, what's going to happen, is again, with this is the idea. If the valve's not opening all the way, okay, let's just say this was the right, or let's make it the left, doesn't matter, but the left atrium, and this is the left ventricle. Okay, when we're having, you know, relaxation, diastole, blood needs to be flowing from the atrium to the ventricle. Uh, if it's the nodding valve, but it doesn't open completely, uh, completely, as the blood's flowing through, it's going to have a murmur because we have, uh, you know, turbulence going on here. It's not completely open. The other one's got a few different sort of names with it. So leaky valves, ones which don't completely close, means when in this case, again, let's just make the example of atrium and ventricle here, that when the ventricle contracts, we wanted these to completely shut so that blood will flow out the arteries. If you have a leaky one, what's going to happen is that some of this blood is going to leak back to, to the previous chamber. In this case, what I'm talking about is the atrium. When it leaks back, it sort of makes a heart sound that's more swishy. Okay, this, these were terms I got from this book, okay? Maybe some extreme, you know, uh, you know, high-level medical text, we'll, we'll call it swishy and whistling, but, um, but that's sort of a, how, to, how to distinguish it. And when you, when you hear it on this site that I have, you'll sort of see the difference. I don't expect you to hear the difference, okay? This is not that level class where I'm going to do some audio and it's like, oh yeah, that must be that. But uh, we're going to see sort of, you know, where that comes into play. Okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of show you, we're going to kind of go through it here a little bit to sort of start to get it. Uh, but over, I'm gonna, I want to go back to that slide in a second. Overall, this is the idea of what causes a murmur. That if you have sort of you know, even flow from one chamber to the next, it doesn't really create sound. Okay? And we'll kind of see this when we do blood pressure as well. So it doesn't create sound. But if you have some sort of you know, restriction, okay, in which either it's not going through, if you have a stenotic valve very easily, or if some of it's kind of coming back because you have, you have a leaky valve, that's going to create turbulence, and that's going to create a sound. Okay, instead of just love dub, we're going to have some swishy whistle sound. Okay, depending on what it is. Okay, so again, stenotic valves are going to be ones which don't allow blood to flow as well, and it's going to create a whistle. And then the uh, the leaky valves, again, also called insufficient. Basically, you'll have backflow swishy. So let's let's. 
without looking at that chart a second, uh, the, this is going to take a little more time to get. But I just want to start it now, because I don't expect us all to actually be able to do and sort of interpret this. Because, you know, I'm going, to want to, I'm going to want you to kind of know this, okay, what you're going to hear with the seventh scope, and identify the problem of either synodic or, uh, or leaky valve. But, you know, it's another one of those things that if you try to memorize that, it's just, it's just a waste of time, okay? You, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, unless you're like, you know, you've got a photographic memory, it's sort of a waste of time. You can figure this out. You can figure this out. And I'm going to start to show, just start to show you how. So, let's have, let's have a, a, a problem with the mitral valve. So what do you want, which problem do you want? Do you want it leaky or do you want it stenotic? Okay, let's make it stenotic. Again, what is stenotic? What does that mean? The valve doesn't completely open. Okay? And the mitral valve is between where? That's going to get a big part here. Okay. Okay, overall, this is the what? <laughs> okay, this is very basic. Okay, I have four chambers of the heart. Okay, I'm upper right here. It is the right atrium, right ventricle. Left ventricle. Okay, where is the mitral valve? Okay, that's the AV valve that's basically controlling between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Okay, so that's the one we're using. That's going to be the mitral valve. And again, if it's working properly, there's going to be no murmur. But we made it so it's not going to completely open. And so as blood is flowing from the left atrium to the left ventricle, we're going to hear a whistle. A type of murmur which is, you know, we're going to classify as a whistle type murmur. Okay, because that's what we just showed. Right? Everybody agree with that? If you go... Uh, if we go back to that. Okay, so we're doing that first one. So we're going to hear... Uh, no, no. Yeah, let me go because I have the wrong one. Get to the actual slide. We're going to hear sort of a whistle. As the blood is flowing through there, it's, it's not going to make no sound attached to the whistle. So we're going to kind of go through this. And let's start here. Okay? When the left, left ventricle contracts, so we're going to have left ventricle, and what do we call contraction? Systole. Systole. So the left ventricles, we're going to start right here. The left ventricle is going to contract, okay? So I, because you'll see kind of why I want to start here. When when it begins to contract, the very beginning of systole, what's going to happen to this valve? It's going to close. It's going to close, and we're going to hear love. love. First heart. There's no problem with this closing, right? We don't have the other one. So if we're starting here, the, the, we're going to basically go through systole, okay? And then we're going to hear love. Okay? Now, okay, so does everyone get that? Mm -hmm. Right? Beginning of systole, the AV valve shut. Okay? Love. Alright? Now, what is it doing while it's going through systole? It's pumping blood out to the arteries. Okay? And then we're going to go into what? Diastole. Okay? And when diastole, so we hear the love, then we're going to go into diastole. And the very beginning of diastole, okay, so we've contracted, the very beginning of diastole, what valves are going to shut? No. We, we just pumped the blood out. The semilunar valves. Actually, let me just go back as we're doing it. This is, okay, the, in fact, this is a great slide. Because as soon as, as soon as we go again, relaxation is diastole, as soon as we do that, the very beginning of that, those valves shut to prevent backflow. And when they shut, what do we hear? Dove. So we go through as we go. But look at what's happening then as diastole proceeds. Okay? 
you know, the very beginning of the acid as the pressure just starts, and we'll deal a lot with that, we basically hear the dove because the, uh, the, 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 the semi lunar valve shut. But what's happening over here? At that same time, blood is filling up. That's the whole idea of diastole, right? Diastole will be a period of filling. And if you look at this, you know, we don't have it, and if you didn't know before this, it's not like the atria fill up and then the ventricles fill up. Basically, as soon as you go in diastole, we're filling from the bottom up. So diastole means that blood is flowing from the atria to the ventricles at that point, too. Are we going to hear something if we have a stenotic mitral valve? As that, that's filling up. If this valve isn't opening completely, yes. yeah. we're going to hear a whistle. whistle. So, if, and that, this is, let's see if we did this right. By doing this, we're saying if you have a stenotic mitral valve, you expect lub, dub, whistle. Okay? Because, and, and you'll see, you actually see the idea, instead of having, because you'll see this on, the, on the, the video, I wish I could show it now, you know, you have a lub and a dove, you know, and the sound wave will show up. You'll see lub, dove, that's how it normally works. This one, you'll see a lub, dove, and then you'll, you'll have continuation. You'll have a murmur to continue it, which will be more like a whistle. So, to, again, if you, and let's see if we did it right, because, you know, I haven't done this a lot, let's actually see. Okay? So, we look at this. We're looking at a stenotic AV valve. Love, dove, whistle. So, again, I don't expect, I don't want to do all four of these. I'm only practicing with them. But, but if you start to follow this, what I think is really important, and just go through this each step of what's happening, not only are you going to understand blood flow on this, but you're going to be able to actually know and predict which ones these are. But, it, but memorizing them is stupid, I bet. Okay. At the beginning, I was trying to memorize it or looking at memorizing it. It doesn't even make sense to do it. You're not even understanding what's going on. By actually working through each one of these and practicing, you actually understand sort of, you know, the, the normal flow and how these things are affecting it. So does everyone, again, I don't expect, I mean, it's confusing, right, for the first time. But does everyone kind of get the process there? Yeah. And the basic idea of the two types of valves. Oh, I'm sorry, the two types of problems we're dealing with. And we're going to see some of the video I showed, too, and actually show that flow. But stenotic valves basically don't open completely, and so they're going to create a murmur because of that turbulence, more of a high-pitched murmur. If you have an insufficient valve, a leaky valve, the idea is blood is going to leak back to the previous chamber, creating sort of a swishy murmur compared to the other one. And we'll literally hear these. It's a good sight. But since we don't have... Uh, it's actually... And these other videos I'm going to show, too, that show some of this, show the, uh, that Doppler effect. That's what I put up there, and you have that on the PowerPoint. This is the site that has a lot of good information that in lab I'll actually start to show, but you can see on your own, especially looking at these heart sounds. Questions? Let's get to the cell, okay? Let's get... We've looked at some overall ideas of how blood flows and how the heart works, but this really is physiology, especially in this course, a very cell-based course, so let's look at the muscle cells themselves and actually look at some of the electroactivity in the heart. Now, those first two bullet points remind me to remind you that when you look at the study questions for this section, there's a couple of them that I'm not lecturing on. A couple of them you have to sort of look in the book, and I have copies of the book uh, there. As far as uh, last section I said, we weren't going to compare skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscles, okay? And basically, uh, we're going to wait to this section to do it. So at the end of uh, chapter 12, I think it is, the, uh, the, uh, the end of chapter 12, the skeletal muscle chapter, it actually has like a chart and a couple pages on how smooth muscle works and comparing them. It's up to you to basically look at the chart and actually get, you know, get the, the pertinent information out of it. I'm not going to give a, spike, a, a different lecture on it. So, but one thing about this is that whereas skeletal muscle is multinucleated, cardiac muscle are single, uh, have a single nucleus, they have a lot of mitochondria because they need a lot of energy to go 24-7. This one I mentioned in the first part of the course. When we're looking at the connections between the heart cells, okay, these interrelated discs, there are two main types of connections we talked about that are very important for cardiac function. Desmosomes, so that we have the structural support. Remember, that was the strongest uh, interaction, cell-cell. And gap junctions, 
direct communication so that we can you know, communicate electrically so that all the cells will contract in a particular uh, chamber at once. So we need rapid. We can't deal with neurotransmitters being released, binding to receptors. We're talking ion flow directly from one cell to the other. Gap junction. Now we begin to see a couple things. We begin to have the idea that when we look at the heart, you can take the heart out without any nervous system innervation to it, and it's going to keep beating for a while. And the reason is, it has its own sort of network called pacemaker cells, which are the dark purple here, which basically, they don't contract. They're the non-contractile cells. They're not actually contracting. But what they're doing is generating action potentials throughout this on their own, spontaneously reaching X potentials that will then spread out to the rest of the heart to cause contraction. That's what's going to be pacemaking, okay, the pacemaker of the heart, the basic idea of how the heart's going to contract is internal. It's these sort of, uh, in, in dark purple, these pacemaker cells. And, you know, I list them a couple times. That's a simple diagram. Here's the other one. I don't really want you to, to memorize any of their words. Right now, I just want to read these and kind of you know, introduce it. We're going to talk a lot about this next time. We're going to look at EKGs. The next lab, we're going to measure EKGs you know, after the exam, et cetera. But if you look at the overall pathway of these pacemaker cells, we're going to see a normal heart, it's going to be initiated by, by cells within the SA node. And just looking at the dark purple, you're going to see that that node signal spread to the internodal pathway shown in dark purple to the AV node, which is between the atrium and ventricles, to another set of, ce of cells within this network called the AV bundle. We have two sides of the heart, so it goes to bundle branches, and then up Purkinje cells. Okay? Those names, in that order, that represents the pacemaker cells of the heart, the ones that are, that are not actually contracting. But you can just begin to visually see, okay, you don't have to color this in, Basically, this figure is kind of showing you, okay, as this is happening, as the electroactivity is happening, it's spreading to the other con uh, contractile cells of the heart to cause contraction. And so you can kind of see that in the dark purple here, where they're basically going, okay, you start in the SA node, in the internal pathways, you spread out to the atria, it cause contraction. Then we're going to see even more, there's actually a little delay at the AV node compared to how fast it is in the other place. And then we rapidly go down to the, you know, the, the bundle branches of Purkinje cells, but it doesn't spread to the actual contracting cells of the ventricles until the bottom, Purkinje cells up. Okay? It's not spreading out you know, from, from the top down, it's spreading from the, the bottom up. <coughs> so the first question is to ask, why have a little delay here? Why do we want, you know, which we're going to call the AV node delay? Why do we want to sort of pause here a, a slight bit? See, well, it, basically the idea is, to, when it comes down to it, it's sort of like that. Do you want the atria and ventricles to contract at the same time? No. That would be crazy, right? You want what? Atria to contract, ventricles contract, close valves push it out. So when you're looking at this conducting system, it's actually built in normally that you have a slight delay, and we'll see this on the EKG, so that the atrial contract and then the ventricles contract. We want to basically top off the ventricles, that's what the atria's job is with their blood, and then the ventricles are full, we want them to, to basically uh, push it out. That also explains maybe, you know, if we had uh, it spreading to the, to the ventricles from the top bottom, we, you know, you could be contracting the blood down. So we're going, we're squeezing from the bottom up. That's why the signal doesn't reach these cells except through the Purkinje cells. Rapidly down here, and then through the Purkinje cells, it goes to the contractile cells and cause basically ejection. But we're going to revisit this whole pathway uh, next time as well, especially related to the EKG. But these 1%, that represents, again, these, these pacemaker cells of the heart in that order. I have those, those same words there. Okay, two or, two or three more things.
but I will pause talking for a second. You can answer your phone or something. <laughs> Does part of this look familiar? Actinomycin. Okay, so, and again, you, you just on the test, most of you probably got this right. We listed the seven or eight steps of skeletal muscle contraction relaxation, which include an important ion, calcium. Calcium binds to? Troponin, moves. Troponin, allows the power stroke, and then pump calcium back. When we look at the cardiac contractile muscles, the 99%, the middle parts are basically the same. And so and we're going to memorize the 10 parts of this. The, the, what I want to emphasize is the beginning and the end are different. Because for skeletal muscle, okay, you've been looking at that. Well, first of all, if you just look at a sugar alike, which we're, we're not leaving yet, we have this idea inside potassium, some sort of negative, and of course, sodium. Calcium, smiling because it becomes a star in the section, like a big star. Fluoride says, oh, well, I'm, I'm who I am, so he's out there, okay? Doesn't, doesn't really, we don't talk much about fluoride. But calcium is going to be really important. For the skeletal muscle, of course, we just use calcium that was stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You know, if you look at that one we don't have here, we remember we had the DHP receptor, release intracellular calcium, da, 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 da. Okay, guess what? We do have a lot of extracellular calcium here. Skeletal, uh, I'm sorry, cardiac muscle is using that plus extracellular calcium. Calcium is extremely important for cardiac muscle function. We're gonna, I'm going to write it and we're going to see it. The more calcium we have in, the stronger the force of contraction. It's very sensitive and it relies on both sources. Extracellular using a calcium channel and intracellular as well using circulatory reticulum. So the beginning is going to be different. We're going to look at this obviously, of how this happens, compared to skeletal. Middle one's the same, including, you know, to have relaxation in skeletal muscle, we pump calcium back. But, guess what? That means the end has to be different. If we've got extracellular calcium in, we've got to pump that extracellular, or that, that calcium back out. So, beginning and the end are what's different, and that's what I'm going to emphasize right now as far as what's the difference between cardiac and skeletal. Okay, we're not memorizing all the steps, but here's sort of the beginning difference here. Back then, I'll, I'll kind of show it there, but overall, sort of the words are here. So now what's going to basically happen is that we have a voltage-gated calcium channel that once the action, uh, action reaches the cell, again, this is coming by gap junctions, right? As soon as it starts spreading through the cell, you basically have it to activate a voltage-gated calcium channel. Extracellular calcium is coming in, and it actually causes the release of the sarcoplasmic calcium. Calcium mediated calcium release. It's all calcium. Okay? It's called the, the ryanidine uh, ch uh, channel. Usually these DHP, ryanidine, they refer to sort of drugs that affect those particular channels. That's how they're named. Uh, but that's what that channel is. But basically, that's, that's the idea. We're going to have extracellular calcium come in and then trigger more calcium. Again, you know, a calcium spark is sort of an abstract term, but the bottom line is all this calcium, and the more calcium the better, you know, all this calcium is going to trigger a strong, you know, power stroke exactly like we did before. So we don't have to say it again. Calcium binds to bone and tropomycin, but, and we're going to have that. So those, that's the two steps or so that are different. We're using extracellular calcium, and the fact is that we are, uh, you know, then you combining that with sarcoplasma. Okay. If you look at a skeletal muscle, okay, the skeletal muscle, here's the somatic motor neuron with acetylcholine it's trying to release. What's causing the release of acetylcholine into the, into, uh, the neuromuscular junction? So in the nerve terminal, we have a calcium channel. 
Okay, that's right. Okay, skeletal muscle. Okay, is going to be controlled by acetylcholine binding. If you put a calcium channel blocker. Does the skeletal muscle use extracellular calcium? Does it have calcium channels out here? No. No. So it's not going to affect this. It's going to affect what? If you have calcium channel block on this whole thing, the release of neurotransmitter. Okay? The reason I put that question on the test, which is one of the questions, is, and again, I try to make sure people would sort of, that's why, you know, when you have a question like that, I wrote a lot to draw it. I'm putting in the whole neuromuscular junction. I basically said that this cell, that you know, the blocker can't get in and block you know, calcium channels in here at all. So it has to be, do you use extracellular calcium here? Are there calcium channels here? No, but they're here. The correct answer was, it's going to inhibit the release of acetylcholine. And the reason I did this besides <coughs> I like the question is, that would have a completely different effect upon cardiac cells, wouldn't it? If, you, if, you're, if you're basically putting a calcium channel blocker for, uh, for cal uh, calcium for uh, cardiac cells, it's going to block calcium coming in and basically restrict contraction. And guess what? There are drugs out there that we're going to talk about calcium channel blockers. So if you don't want the heart to beat as much, or if you're trying to lower blood pressure, etc., you might use a calcium channel blocker. We're going to see. So difference between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscles are that calcium channel blockers are going to sort of work and affect cardiac muscles directly versus skeletal muscles. Would that be how a muscle relaxer works, or is that a little bit different? Well, that's a, those are skeletal muscle relaxers, so I don't know. Uh, they're not calcium channel blocker for sure. I don't know what, what they do. I have to look those up. I have no idea what, 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 what's within that. Beginning. Okay. Everything else, let's, let's look at this. Okay, yeah, 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 troponin, and we're going to pump calcium back. The other difference, though, and this is going to be important. We're going to have to spend a couple of minutes on this. This... Uh, I might do one thing after that and then repeat it next time. But when you look at the last two steps here, let me just kind of go to where they do it. And they do it in the wrong order because that's how this book is. Okay? We're going to look at these <coughs> last, last two steps. Okay? And really, as listed here. And the idea is we have to pump calcium out. Okay? We all agree with that, right? It came in, we have to pump it out. But we have two steps to do it, and it involves something in Chapter 5 that we skipped because we didn't have time. But it's okay, because we're going to do it now. Okay? So I'm going to race the board now. This probably will be the last thing we do. Okay? And the words are up there, because we're going to do most things, and we're going to see this again and again overall. We're going to do a lot of things sort of using uh, something called the sodium potassium pump, which we did mention, okay? But we're going to actually use that now not to sort of create electricity, but to do some other things, okay? In this case, it's going to help us drive calcium out. And so when we look at this, uh, the idea will be the following, that whenever you pump, okay, if we look at transport, if we look at active transport, So write this down separately because it's not on anything else. When we look at active transport, active transport means it needs energy. Two types, and they're listed up here specifically, primary and secondary active transport. That means both of these are requiring energy but they're doing it different, th different ways. Active transport means you need energy when you're basically moving something which we have talked about against its concentration gradient. So we're going from moving things which are already low to a higher, or moving it up the hill. And we've already shown this for the resting membrane potential. We've already shown the major primary active transporter 
because primary means you use ATP directly to do this. So we've already been introduced to this guy right here in the context of making the resting member of potential. We're pumping sodium out, potassium in, so we have high potassium in and high sodium out. And we've created, again, this took energy, we created these two dams that we used to show how a nerve fires. Okay? Guess what? There's other ways every cell in our body uses the sodium potassium pump to do something. 30% of all of our energy that we eat is to drive this pump. So look how it's working in cardiac cells. Okay? We have low sodium by doing this. And now we can look here. By pumping sodium out, Okay, so we're, again, we're concentrating on the sodium aspect of this, but we're creating low sodium inside compared to out. So if you have a sodium carrier protein, which we do here, okay, and you have high sodium out here and low sodium in here, which way does sodium want to go? Yeah. We want to go, now we want to go, we created these gradients, now we're going to open, the, open the, uh, the dam and allow water to go down. So sodium will now flow down its concentration gradient. But, guess who's attached to this transport? Well, calcium. Now, calcium was going against the concentration gradient, right? We're trying to get rid of all this calcium and put it outside. Did I ever erase the, the life, the circle of life? Remember, the circle of life had calcium high out and chloride. And so, <gasps> we're, by taking calcium in here, we're going against the concentration gradient. We're pumping it all out. That requires energy. But secondary active transport, and I'm going to write up here, it's here doesn't use ATP directly. So this requires energy. Moving calcium out against its concentration requires energy. But instead of using ATP directly, it's using the energy created by this. This created a concentration gradient. So we have low sodium. Okay, that's the way that's it. Now that's going to, that energy is going to be used, that, that concentration, just like you have water in a dam, you open it up, what does it do? It can basically turn turbines and make electricity. It can do something. That's what it's going to do here. In this case, by putting the water in the dam, this primary active transport, and then having this transporter, as sodium runs down, it's moving calcium out against this concentration gradient. So this is being used by this to take calcium out. So this is called primary active transport. Secondary active transport follows, needs energy to do it, which needs energy to drive something against its concentration gradient, but it doesn't use ATP directly. So what it's using, it uses the potential energy created by the primary active transport. I mean, next time I'm going to review this as well. So, then we we'll start to see the process, these work together. So instead, it would be great just to have something like the, the primary active transport guy to just to pump calcium out, but that's just not the way it works. Okay? In this case, we've got this two-step step system, which all of our cells sort of use. We use the sodium potassium pump to create the gradient. That does use ATP. Then we use that gradient to do stuff. In this case, we're going to use that gradient to, to get calcium out of the cell and then to cause relaxation. So look at that again, and we'll deal with it over the weekend. But the next two slides go together, and then we're done for today. But look at this slide, and look what it says. And then, then we're going to talk about a drug that actually utilizes this. So unlike, you know, or, or even, let's say, more than, than, uh, than skeletal muscle, the, the concentration of calcium inside, inside the, the cardiac cell, how much and how long, directly contributes to the force of contraction, okay? How much the muscle cells are contracting, and therefore, as a whole, the contraction of the heart, okay? The contractile force of the heart is dependent upon calcium levels. The more calcium and the longer it stays in, it's going to be a stronger force of contraction, as it says there. Very important. Has anybody heard of digitalis? Yes or no? I didn't see hands. We've heard of it. Guess what? 
we're going to figure out how it works. And what it does is it inhibits the sodium potassium pump. So we're inhibiting this guy. Okay, I like to inhibit the sodium potassium pump, as you can see. Like first question, all that last time. So we're inhibiting the sodium potassium pump. Okay? Now, if we're inhibiting the sodium potassium pump, let's just think about sodium. Okay? We're inhibiting this. What's happening to sodium levels in the cell? Normally, the sodium potassium pump does what to sodium? If it's not working, what's happening to sodium levels in the cell? Staying in. That was the answer to question one, by the way. You're increasing the amount of sodium in the cell because we're not getting rid of it. Okay? And again, that's why I sort of went over, actually, when I was actually doing the review, when I was sort of saying when it wasn't working that you could do a thousand, I kept saying, well, we're getting more sodium in. We'll get more sodium. We'll get, but it will take a lot of it. That's why that was the, the, the right answer to the question. In this case, if we have more sodium here, are we going to have as much of a gradient? Okay? We wanted low sodium to drive this in. We're not going to have as much of a gradient, are we? So, is calcium going to be, are we going to be able to get rid of calcium as well then? Calcium is going to stay there longer. And if calcium stays there longer, what does that mean to the force of contraction? That's what it's done. So when you look at this, and I can write that as well, the idea of digitalis, it inhibits the sodium potassium pump. That means there's more sodium that stays in there so that this exchanger is not going to work very well, okay? Because we wanted that gradient. We, you know, we didn't put as much water in the dam, it's not going to turn the turbines. Calcium stays there longer. And if calcium stays there longer, contractile force increases. So when you think of if you need, you know, if you're having heart failure, if you need to increase how much blood, your blood pressure is too low, and you want to increase how much blood goes out, we actually want to squeeze harder. We want more contractile force. So digitalis will do that. Again, but the cool way is it's actually doing it at this level. It's inhibiting the sodium potassium pump. That means sodium is accumulating here, so we don't have as much of a gradient driving this. If sodium accumulates here, this whole thing doesn't work. That means calcium isn't lost. Calcium stays here. Higher calcium means that you're going to have a stronger contractile force. That's how that drug works. And that's why the, the two points really to make really are the idea of really of, of this. Force of contraction, because we're going to have other drugs like that later. The force of contraction of these cardiac cells, of your heart, directly related to calcium. That's why calcium was smiling up there. I didn't not smiling anymore. Because it's the star. We're going to talk about calcium channel blockers, etc. But in this case, that we leave with today with again with that drug. Digitalis, if you inhibit the sodium potassium pump, sodium stays here. You know, we're not getting rid of it. You don't have a gradient anymore as much. That means this doesn't work effectively. And, you know, I mean, obviously, you're not killing the person, but it's not working as much. That means calcium tends to stay here longer in the heart. That means stronger contractile force. And here's some examples of where you might want to take, you know, have digitalis. The sodium potassium pump runs with, generally, with three sodium in and two <coughs> the, It runs out, right? three, sodium, three sodium out and two potassium in, right? Because remember, we're accumulating sodium out and potassium in, and we had more sodium out than potassium, that helped get that negative uh, overall, right? We were losing, if you put three sodium out, three positive out, and only two potassium in, the cell is becoming more negative. Okay? But without it working, sodium is building up, and you don't have this big gradient anymore. In this case, this guy doesn't work. Calcium stays here. Any questions? So, again, this is... This is cardiac. Cardiac, you, you don't want to get behind on. Uh, a lot of information, we'll review some of this and then go to the next level uh, next time. But we're, gonna, we're adding what I think is sort of you know, real things besides just basic things. Drug effects and, and heart problems. So, I'll see you guys. The grades should be up by the weekend. You'll see the grades. Uh, and Because I haven't gone through them yet. Because I, you know, I have to make sure... There's no mistakes, I gotta look at questions, that kind of thing. So No, your lab test will be directly written. Thanks, thanks for bringing those